to all of you in Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean and beyond, welcome. Thanks for joining us this webinar Wednesday as we discuss behavioral competencies in times of crisis. I am your host, Taryn Hodges. Webinar Wednesdays are brought to you by the Lockjack GSB Organizational Consulting Services. During this time of the coronavirus pandemic, the Lockjack GSB is taking great strides to stay connected with you and to keep serving our clients throughout the Caribbean. Some of our efforts are more webinar Wednesdays in an effort to provide relevant information for the development of organizations and professionals. So therefore look out, we'll be having webinar Wednesdays three to four times a month uh, to keep you engaged and to give you information to help you build your organizations. So stay connected to our social media pages uh, or contact us and that information would be placed in the chat box for you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, as the case may be on Instagram where we'll be posting and advertising the upcoming uh, Webinar Wednesday events. Our full range of consulting services are now online as well. That is one of our responses to this particular crisis. Logjack GSB Consulting has over, for, for more than 15 years uh, provide online organizational solutions to our clients. So this is not a new event for us. Thus today, with our well-established remote working technology, we are able to execute on our ongoing consulting projects and aid our customers during this time of crisis. We also recognize that during this time and post COVID-19, that our clients will need will have needs to redesign or restructure their organization, re-engineer processes, manage change, keep employees engaged, draft new HR policies such as working from home policies, and we are here to help you. All of those services we have available and we are ready to engage our customers. A full range of organizational diagnostic tools, both psychometric and organizational analysis tools are all online. Hence, we are ready to support you and help you transition online with your talent management and organizational development initiatives. Our training has also moved to online platforms or continue on online platforms and therefore our upcoming WAVE Psychometric Certification Program will be conducted online on May 26, 2020. The link to register for this program, if you are interested in becoming certified, which is an online tool, uh, which you can use to recruit, select, uh, develop your talents within the organization, that link to register will be placed in the chat box and if you wish to find out more information or get a program outline, you can contact us at consult at lockjackgsb.edu.tt or at odat at lockjackgsb.edu.tt. And both of these email addresses will also be placed in the chat box. We want to hear from you. Our webinar Wednesday is a free initiative that and your feedback allows us to help evolve and develop and make, choose relevant topics that would be of beneficial to you. The feedback is also great for our various speakers. So therefore, we invite you to give us your feedback at the end of today's webinar at the link provided on your screen and which will also be placed in your chat box. Now, I am very pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Mika Joseph. Dr. Joseph is an industrial and organizational psychologist who is a behavioral and psychometric expert. And 
Dr. Joseph Nord own in her studies as an industrial and organizational psychologist was not only trained to use but also develop psychometric instruments and as such she has a wealth of knowledge about how to use these things, why are, they, why are psychometric tools reliable, how do we manage behavior and how observing and managing behavior can help the organizations grow and improve. She is also a consultant and a lecturer at Arthur Lockjack Global School of Business and she has bringing, so she has great knowledge in implementing solutions, organizational, psychometric and behavioral solutions to organizations both locally and throughout the Caribbean. So we are very pleased to have Dr. Nika Joseph with her. Nika. Hello, thank you very much, Taryn. Good day to everyone. Um, I am uh, pleased to present to you today my presentation on how behavioral competencies are essential in the time of crisis. So let me just make sure I get my, ah, here we go. So <clears throat> at the end of my time with you today, I would like you to know three things. So you need to take away three important factors at the end of our little chat this evening. So the first key takeaway would be the importance of behavioral competencies. So what are competencies in general? They consist of knowledge, which you require through school or any kind of informal teachings, life experiences. So we get knowledge. We have skills, which are also learned. Things like riding a bicycle can be a skill that you have. And then it also consists of our abilities. Some of us have natural abilities, like the ability to sing and so forth. And all of these come together to form a competency. However, those things fall more in the category of technical competencies, the ability to do tasks and get jobs done. But what I want to focus more is in the behavioral part of it, the behavioral competencies. And what does this entail? And how does it make it different from a technical competency? To move from your technical and task ability into more of a behavioral competency, three components, which are not usually seen on the surface of people, um, come into play. These are your motives. And motives is what drives you or your need to, to act. How would you, why would you behave in a particular way? What are the things that motivate you to engage in certain behaviors? It also includes your traits. So you have some natural personality traits that would have evolved through nature and nurture over time. And so now these also come into play to motivate or, sorry, influence the way that you act. And finally, your attitudes. How do you feel towards something? What are those emotional drivers? And all of this comes together to formulate your behavioral competencies. Now, what does this mean? Let me walk you through a process. Think about it simply. You have a group of persons working on a project. You put them together because they have all the strong KSAs that they need, all the knowledge, skills, and abilities in order to execute a task. However, the quality of the project at the end depends on how they do the task and not just their ability to do the task. So if they have the traits of conscientiousness, for example, that means it will be done in a timely manner and um, free of errors. So they'll be doing a lot of error checking, attention to detail, because these are the things that drive somebody with a conscientious type of personality. If they feel passionate about the impact of the project and they feel committed to what getting it done, then it will be complete, be completed thoroughly. So what that means is that you wouldn't get the little excuses here and there about, well, we did up most of it, but not all of it. When people have a passion for the work that they're doing, it goes to completion. And finally, 
if they feel good about engaging in the task, that they, those um, activities make them feel happy and they enjoy doing them, again, overall, you get a, nice, a complete project that is um, of high quality. So you would see different types of behaviors coming out based on these things. Your, those groups of persons will be engaging in behaviors like problem solving. Instead of going and asking for assistance from a, a, a manager or a supervisor, unless it's absolutely necessary, they will come together and do a lot of problem solving. A lot of teamwork will be happening. Um, time management and attention to detail will be engaged and a lot of positive communication. These terms that I'm throwing out all fall into the category of behavioral competencies. And this comes from the mixing of your knowledge, skills, and abilities with your motives, traits, and attitudes. And what you get at the end is a successful project. And you can extend your project beyond to an organization and, um, and departments and organizations so that everybody has this high performance. So I asked you to envision a very positive scenario, but you can see, or you can all foresee the possibility of what will happen if some of these motives or traits are in the negative end. And therefore, behavioral competencies truly impact the way in which an organization functions. So the things that they directly um, influence would be employee performance, workforce planning. When you know what people's traits and what their areas of strengths and developments are, then when you put together your teams or you put people in different areas to engage in certain activities, then you can plan that out a lot better. Same thing for succession planning. What are the behaviors that you want passed along as one person leaves and someone else fills those roles? So you want to be able to understand what are the behaviors that made the predecessor successful so that the person that's coming in, they can adopt some of those behaviors as well. Of course, performance appraisal. The way to get a good behavior continuing over and over again is to reward it. So if we reward good behavior, then you would see, um, you would see that increased in the organization. And so therefore it leads to higher performance and uh, less issues. And of course the organization culture. The core competencies can be rolled out for the entire organization. So looking at your core values of the company, your mission, your vision, everything that you would want the company to stand for, if it's about customer service and being customer oriented, or if it's about being innovative, then those are the competencies that can be seen for all the positions throughout your organization. So now that is worked into your performance appraisal, that is worked into your succession planning. And so you would see that employees will engage in these behaviors on a regular basis. And then anybody who has to external to your organization have to do any engagement with you, then they will say, yes, that I had great customer service or that company is known for their innovation. So the behavior actually spills out even further beyond just the organization itself. So all stakeholders and everyone in the public sphere also has that connection to these behaviors. So this takes me to my first poll question. So my organization employs behavioral competencies in its talent management. So we've just launched a poll. So we are inviting you all to respond to my organization employs behavioral competencies in its talent management. So if it's to a greater extent whereby you use it in all, almost all of your talent management from recruitment and selection, training and development, succession planning, restructuring, then it's to a greater extent. 
if it's only used in some areas, for example, recruitment selection, training and development, succession planning, but not other areas will be somewhat. But if it's very little, only used probably only for recruitment or only when you have certain training, and then not at all would be, well, not at all. So we will just give you all just a few more seconds to respond before we end the polling. All right, so we will end the polling now. And we, Nico, are you seeing the results now? Yes, I am. So I am with you. Okay, so based on the poll results, we're seeing that it's somewhat used within the organization. And I'm guessing it's used in different areas depending on um, what is most important for the company. So sometimes people would use it just for performance appraisal systems or they may use it in other areas. In this case, I'm going to demonstrate ways in which we can incorporate it in times of crisis. So that is going to come later on. And you will see how much behavioral competencies can evolve in your organization. But the next step that I would like to take you through would be the second takeaway for this afternoon would be the importance of psychometric assessment. So now that you know what behavioral competencies are and you are going to be excited to use them and incorporate them even more in your organization, the next step will be to take a look at how do you even determine what behaviors or measure those behaviors so you know um, what your employees are capable of doing. So a psychometric assessment or a standard and scientific method used to measure individuals' mental capabilities and behavioral styles. So in other words, they measure competencies, both technical and behavioral. So there are different ways in which this is done. There are several different types of instruments. So we'll go through the different groups that exist at the moment. So the first are intelligence tests. These measure knowledge, aptitude, and reasoning. This will include your knowledge and information, your knowledge and information about um, executing tasks. So it can go beyond just someone's resume. So a lot of you, when you are doing your recruitment process or even promotion, will take I will have access to a person's resumes or their CVs, which we'll talk about their varying degrees. Now that would be an indicator of what they know. But if everyone applying for a particular job has a degree in a particular subject area, then you will want to probably get further information about other aspects of the knowledge that they need to have in order to execute the job. So an intelligence test can help do that. Beyond an intelligence test, You have simulations, and simulations are designed to mimic the job itself. They can range from a low fidelity simulation, which means it doesn't quite match the job. In that case, um, candidates or persons participating in the, in the assessment, they would be given maybe some different work scenarios, and they have to determine what would be the best um, way in which to solve a particular problem or the best way to approach a situation. So that is considered a low fidelity type of simulation. Or a high fidelity simulation goes all the way up to a work sample. And this means somebody is actually um, engaging in the job on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in a simulated type of in, uh, environment. So if they do make mistakes or errors, it does not um, directly impact the business. So simulators can be both for behavioral as well as technical skills. So what most people would think of when, when they think of a simulation is um, for 
pilots and they actually get to sit in a cockpit and it moves around and you could press the buttons and you make decisions. And what is happening is the computer is programmed to um, throw out different scenarios or problems that they may face when in a real flight and they would adjust and persons will observe their behavior and observe their technical skills in, um, in the situation and give them assessments and feedback about how they perform during the simulation. So it's also used for uh, medical personnel. They have, um, when I was working on my PhD, we did stuff with the medical field where they actually had virtual um, emergency rooms and they got the experience of being with all the, the noises and the lights and stuff like that going off. And um, so they got a more realistic experience about being in an emergency room, even though they were um, still students, because they weren't quite ready yet to be um, in, the, in the hospitals itself. So all of these are simulations that can be used for um, assessing your competencies. Then they have something called business games. Now, games are typically for behavioral um, competencies and they have, just like the simulation, games can be very simple to little cup stacking challenges to complicated, like uh, a Sims type of simulation where you are the, you are leading uh, amusement park empire and you need to expand and um, change the prices for popcorn and make different decisions and stuff like that but it's a game type of setting and so um, and you are given different feedback and so forth so games can also be used as a type of psychometric instrument and finally there's what we call the personality inventories which a lot of you may be familiar with and a personality inventory also includes things like um, integrity tests and interest tests. And these all measure the motives, traits, and attitudes part of the behavioral competency. So with these type of inventories or assessments, you can determine if people like certain types of activities. Do they like to work in groups? Do they like to work alone? Are you, um, do you have a preference for order? And things being in a particular structure or do you prefer things to be a little chaotic or um or always changing right so these inventories help to measure those aspects of um, a behavioral competence now all of these psychometric um, instruments as taryn mentioned in her presentation are all available online or through technology there is some way for all of these types of instruments to be prevent, um, presented, whether in low fidelity or high. Um, but what I want to introduce to you here at this point, what is most important about psychometric instruments, is not about the mode of delivery, if it's paper-based or online, but really and truly the correct selection of the particular test. In each of these categories, there are different um, tests or different types of assessment. These can measure different competencies from varying levels of proficiency. So some are better for entry level staff, while others are more designed or better designed for senior level staff. So psychometric tests, in determining which one is best, you have to consider job level, job type, the competencies of interest, and the purpose in which you are going to use it for. Some tests, if you're using it for developmental purposes, then you apply them differently than if you are using it for an administrative purpose, recruitment or promotion, etc. So depending on those types of information, would the factor into how you make a decision on which test to use. And because of that, that impacts the accuracy in which the instrument can predict the performance. So all psychometric tests do 
is the assessed person's behavior or their technical skills at this stage in order to determine how best they can perform when they're on the job. And so if you select an instrument that's not the best for that particular job level or job type or job function, then it may not be the best predictor for the behaviors that you're looking for. And therefore, I recommend these best practices. Use trained experts. It's important that they can help guide you through the different types of instruments and selection of instruments. So for example, quite simply, if you go and Google personality tests, there are those that exist that will measure personality based on you choosing a certain shade of blue. However, that may not be the most valid and reliable measure of personality. And so anybody will say, okay, well, this works and that works. But a trained expert will be able to assess the actual instrument that needs to be used and make sure that it is valid and reliable and is suited for the group of people that you're going to use it for. They can explain these things to you and clarify all the different um, ways in which it could be used and which is best used. A trained expert also has a wider range of instruments that they can choose from. So some of us may be familiar with one or two types of tests or names of tests that are popular, but they may not be the only ones that exist. And I know everybody's going to be concerned about their budget moving forward. So it's good to have a trained expert consult with you so that you are getting the best bang for your buck when you're choosing an instrument. Also, on your end, you need to be clear about what it is that you really and truly want to measure. We each will have our own definition for leadership, our own definition for customer service. We will have different types of behaviors that make sense for our organization or business plan so therefore it is you it's important that you're very clear about what it is that you would like the instrument to measure it is also best practice to have multiple assessors so when we do interviews and you have multiple interviewers and that is because um you don't want to have any bias in the interpretation of the results and so forth is the same thing for psychometrics. It's really, really important that especially if you're having things like an assessment center where people are engaging in different simulations and you're observing behavior, you want to have more than one person make that observation so that you have as much notes and, and evidence so that when you make a judgment call about any particular candidate that it is um, accurate and with the most amount of information. And finally, you should, and, well, before we get to finally, um, you should also have a post assessment session. It's important that you have some type of feedback with the candidate or even for yourselves to kind of review um, what has taken place and the different things that happen and get people's opinions about the process. Because if you're doing these psychometrics on a regular basis, it's important that you um, have these post-assessment sessions. And finally, and I meant this point out there, and to make it very clear, use psychometrics in conjunction with other information. This is to be repeated. Use psychometrics in conjunction with other information. A psychometric test does not have to go alone. You still need to get the resume or CV. You still should do reference checks. You should get as much information to back up what is being um, answered in a psychometric. In some cases, you may be just using a self-report personality test. And in that case, people, most people know themselves really, really well, but there are one or two people that are not quite too sure if they're three or a four on the rating scale. And so having other pieces of information from references and so forth can help um, really get an accurate picture. Further to that, um, you can also verify things 
in an interview, if an interview follows a psychometric, which should. Um, so you do a psychometric test before, maybe do, even if it's an assessment center or something as simple as a, a personality test. And then in the interview, you can ask one or two questions about how they incorporate those things in the workplace. So that way you get um, a clearer understanding that even though they have a preference to work in a group, they may have certain things about that group that you, know, you may want to know about. So it may be a group of people that they are generally familiar with or very similar to them, but they may have difficulty and challenges with persons who are maybe a bit different from them. And therefore you can ask those questions and you would know in preparation that with my organization and um, there's a lot of um, variety in different types of people so this may not be the best fit for that particular person at this time so you get a little more information using the psychometrics in this way in conjunction with other information so this leads to the second poll question my organization uses psychometric assessments to assess behavioral competencies So we just launched a second poll. My organization uses psychometric assessments to assess behavioral competencies. And we're asking you to use the same scale to rate. So a great extent means that you're using it across the, on all your talent management engagements, somewhat uh, meaning about two or three, very little, maybe just one, not at all. I noticed some persons are saying they're not seeing the poll. Just give us a moment because it's launched on our end. So we're just going to try and relaunch the poll so that you can respond.
Okay, so while we address those technical difficulties, we will come back to the poll question. That's fine. The poll question a little later, Nika, if you go ahead. Sure, not a problem. So we move on to the third key takeaway, and which is why we're all here. So how do we incorporate behavioral competencies in times of crisis? So in times of crisis, things change. While I cannot predict the future based on some simple observations and past case studies, we know that the following is going to take place. There's going to be some type of new organization structure. You're going to have new workflows, new job descriptions and positions, new competency definitions. So in terms of organization structure, we may move from this kind of more traditional structure to something looking like a virtual remote um, work. Now, not everyone is going to go fully virtual. Everybody's got, some people are going to go to different varying versions of this, depending on the type of organization you have, but there will be a change in your organization structure. We also would see changes in workflows. So with more technology, things, some things will become automated. And with that, you're gonna have new processes are introduced, and so your workflows will have to be adjusted. Job positions and descriptions will also change. We have already been forced to determine which positions are essential, right? and what new job roles are now going to be needed post um, the pandemic. So though somebody may be considered essential, and I want to make this clear, they may be essential during a time of quarantine. It does not mean that other persons are not going to become essential post um, pandemic time. But we are forced to kind of make those kind of decisions and think about our job descriptions and positions in our organization in such a way um, to determine, okay, how do I function even with the bare minimum, right? So all of these things come into play during a time of crisis, and therefore your core competencies will start to change. So a simple example, our current grocery store chains have gone online in varying ways. Some have apps, online shopping, Others have emailed the list and I will fill it for you, curbside pickup, but they've all introduced some type of technology to your shopping experience. And for most of them, I do not foresee them removing this option. They've already spent the time and energy and money to launch an app. I cannot see them no longer using the app post pandemic. So what does this mean for their business? They now need people to manage that platform. They now have delivery service. They now have a technical team with a help desk and customer service, et cetera. All come on, online just by simply introducing an app with some online shopping. So you are seeing how all of these, um, just one simple little thing is impacting the business. And so new behaviors become core. Being technology oriented, becomes a core competency for all staff, right? Now you also have remote staff. We talked about things like problem solving, taking initiative. Those things have to come into play when you're working from home. Your time management changes if your home has children in it or they don't. So all of these things come as part of core competencies that were not in previous times um, what people were interested in measuring. At least they were nice to house, but not the main thing that was done. You have things like adaptability, open to change, resilience, stress tolerance. All of these are new behavioral competencies that we have been measuring before, as I said, but it wasn't across the board for all organizations. Now it's going to become something that is what you will see more prominent for most companies. And of course, leadership, though it is going to remain there as a core competency, the way we define it and the type of behaviors that are 
would make somebody a successful leader would change because now they're leading virtual teams. Now they're leading persons who are their own problem solvers and taking initiative. And if you have majority of your staff with those types of behaviors, then the way you lead them, the way you motivate them, the way you coach them will of course have to change. So what are our next, what are our next steps to incorporate behavioral competencies into your org organization change activities. Some businesses may go to a brand new business model. They may switch from a, a standard store or face-to-face -face onto complete e-commerce. So here, psychometrics can help and, behave, and of course they're measuring behavioral competencies. So we'll talk about, they help to identify competencies in the new core job positions help you to reassign employees strategically, and of course, form part of the recruitment and selection process for your new business model. So if you're switching to e-commerce, your website may not have been that big a deal before. You could have had a remote organization, somebody external to the company manage your website. You won't making changes on a regular basis. However, if you switch to a new e-commerce model, then your website needs to be updated on a regular basis. So you may decide to bring that as an in-house department, so brand new department is being created and a whole set of new positions are opening up for your organization. So psychometrics behavioral competencies come into play here. So you have a more efficient implementation of your strategy plan and you have a shortened trans transition time moving your company from um, its original structure to the new model. Retooling and training will also occur for those of you who are not completely um, changing your business. So, but there will be some areas where you will have to train and update staff on use of certain types of technology or software or plat um, platforms that you're introducing. So psychometrics will help you um, understand the current proficiency of your staff and look at the individual as well as group strengths and development areas. And this will allow you to have targeted training only for those who need it, or maybe not at a beginner's level. Some people may be able to enter training at an intermediate level or advanced level once you know what their proficiencies are. And of course, this will help you lower cost. So that means you're not sending people for these long courses when they could have just um, engaged in a shorter course or for a shorter time and you're also not sending everyone when only a few people need uh, the training. And in case that we do have to do staff reduction, um, psychometrics can be used for selection as well as succession planning. It means that you're making more strategic selection, you're maintaining the retention of essential workers. So you don't just say well anybody who wants to leave, go ahead, what this way you can actually um, make sure that the persons that you need in the core areas, essential areas that have the behaviors and the competencies that you need for the, the business moving forward, that those persons are kept. And even if persons have taken up the option to leave, um, that they can pass on the, the information, the knowledge, the skills, and um, any other behavioral uh, things that you need, that that can be passed on to the next person that's going to fill the role. So you have more of a seamless transition and continuity for your organization. So what you don't want is that there's this big gap in, in your, in your a skills gap or a competency gap in your organization, even if you have to do staff reduction. So I told you there were three things you needed to know. One, behavioral competencies, they are crucial for your organization and the organization's success. Two, psychometric assessments can effectively measure these behavioral competencies so you know what you're working with. And three, in time of crisis, behavioral competencies can impact your business strategies. And as a little bonus, you also learned that psychometric assessment can provide cost and time saving benefits to your change process. 
So your three things for today. Nico, you can probably take this opportunity to launch the poll again. Sure. And I would like to put my little message here. Please stay home, stay safe, and save lives. Thank you very much. So we've relaunched the poll, uh, asking you to respond. My organization uses psychometric assessments to assess behavioral competencies. So your organization may be using behavioral competencies, but it may not be employing uh, psychometric assessments as a form of measurement. And so we want to hear from you whether to a great extent you're using it across the board in all areas of talent management. Somewhat in just a few, very little, probably in just one area or not at all. So we leave the poll open just a little while longer for a few more persons to get an opportunity to vote. Okay, so we will take close polling at this point in time. Okay. Go ahead, Nika. Okay, so I'm seeing um, a very little as a winner here, um, but keep in mind, um, psychometrics can be used in, um, as an introductory for some of you may just be using it for recruitment and selection, but I hope you learned today of many other ways in which both um, using of psychometrics in your organization can really help you tailor and fine tune um, the types of um, behavioral competencies that are relevant, right? And to get accurate measures of your employees um, or even potential persons that you're going to hire so that you have a, um, an organization that can uh, take you through the crisis and beyond. Uh, Thank you. I think we're doing Q&A now, Taryn. Yes. <laughs> All right. So we would have invited persons to share uh, or ask their questions in the uh, poll. Um, someone is asking, what role does nervousness or fear play in in this, and I guess to mean when someone is actually completing the assessment exercise, would it have an impact on the results if they are a little nervous or if they are fearful in completing the assessment exercise? Nika? Yes, so um, that is a factor. So two things are really good to help with that. The first would be to make sure you prepare persons beforehand, um, especially if you're doing assessments for a development purpose then if you have a little more um, leeway, I say, in terms of preparing persons for what's to come. In, in terms of persons for recruitment, you need to provide them with the much information in terms of what is the purpose of this, why it's going to be used, how it's going to be used, and the way in which it's going to be structured. So they themselves can, can prepare for what they're going to face. So they're aware that they're going to be Let's say we do it assessment centers. Sometimes we do it for an entire day or half day. We let them know, look, you're going to be at a site for four hours. You're going to um, engage in a series of different types of tasks. These are the things that we, um, you will be experiencing. So they can let themselves prepare. Now, the other thing, remember I said, do not use psychometrics without other information. So after we've done the psychometric, um, you can always talk to them in an interview or in a post session and they can clarify, look, I was a little nervous. A lot of times the first question I ask in a post session, so how did you find the process? And that will help them be like, oh, I was a little nervous. I, was like, I said, okay, so how did that, do you think that impacted the way you answer? And so that helps you kind of see where things are and it gives you more information about the person. So I hope that helps, but it does kind of influence what you try your best to prepare persons so they wouldn't be as anxious. And I will add, Nika, that is why we often say uh, 
using a trained expert is so important because we it's part of that whole administration process the reliability of the tool lies in how it's administered um, and as a trained expert you're trained in terms of uh, dealing with those particular situations uh, someone is asking, and I guess I can respond to this, is there anywhere online we can reference sample of assessments? You can actually contact us uh, and we would have provided our contact information and we have sample reports and instruments and there, uh, it's a, there may be one instrument but it produces several reports. So it's best to understand what are you hoping to achieve and then we can, or what is your business context and then we can provide you with the applicable examples of the types of reports that could be generated that will be beneficial to your particular business context and your situation. Nika, do you have anything you want to add there? Um, yeah, so it, there are varying levels. So um, simulations may not be so readily available, especially your high fidelity ones because they take a little time to put together. Um, but there are some versions of um, personality inventories that are available online that you could kind of take a look at. They will tell you this is a free version. It's not really as reliable or in depth. Um, most of the sites will have little sample questions here and there. So you can get a sense of um, the, the format in which it's presented. Now, each format has its own pros and cons. And so again, uh, expert will be able to walk you through the process so then it's easier for you to understand which one is best applicable for your organization. So um, there are samples available. I don't know if there's, there's no particular website I would say that has all the psychometrics and all uh, samples for everyone. Um, so it's kind of shopping around at different places um, online. But it's easier if you just <laughs> check us uh, uh, testing company like uh, Lovejack and they will be able to guide you accordingly. Right, so one person is asking, which is, which is a very important question. So how, I guess, how do you represent, how do you make the business case for the importance of psychometric tests in the face of budgetary constraints? And in this time of crisis, I can see companies facing that uh, budgetary constraints. So I guess the question is, is it worth the investment? So um, that question comes all the time and I will always say yes. Um, but let me, let me clarify why I say yes. Um, so if we take the simple, let's take um, staff reduction because this, this may be something that people um, are looking at at this time. They're not too sure what is going to happen moving forward. Um, you want to be able to have your company function um, beyond the crisis. And you want to be able to have persons that have the skill set that can execute or engage in the, in the company activities in whichever direction you choose to go. So, um, as I said, you may have a complete remodel or, or create new business model, or you may shift to some kind of hybrid in between. You want to be able to have persons that can execute the job functions and job duties that are going to happen post the crisis. The only way to determine who those persons are is accurately is to use uh, the psychometrics in some type of process so that you know who is proficient in the different levels. And remember, we talked about it's not just about your knowledge, skills, and abilities, but if you have the, the traits and the, motive and the motivation and the passion for even the work, because that changes who is going to work the extra hours or stay late or um, make sure that they share with the their team or put the organization first when they're making certain types of decisions so all of that comes in and you need to have a good understanding of who you have in front of you so you can make a, a good decision or the best decision that you can under the circumstances if you do not know who those persons are and they may leave your organization what that means is that you have um, your company will be not would not be as efficient 
or as effective moving forward, or it takes a longer time for you to transition through to the post-pandemic or crisis situation. So what a psychometric does, as I mentioned, is it helps you to make those strategic decisions and that will shorten your transition time. And then once you come out from tra in tra transition, you will have a core team of employees that you know are capable and want to <laughs> and motivated to work in your organization because mm -hmm. that has become very important. I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. I think uh, I saw something on leadership. I'm, I'm, there, there are several questions here. So um, I'm going to just jump around. Can someone cheat on the assessment and will it be detected is what someone is asking. And I, I, I'm raising it because I know it's often a question that is asked and why, one of the reasons people stare away from assessment. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't have to bring up the debate. So, technically, um, someone can do response distortion on certain types of assessments. So, if you are rating on a one to five scale and they ask about your punctuality, I guess you know you're applying for a job, so you're going to up that, um, your score, your rating on something like that. It's a little more difficult to do it on a simulation type of assessment because um, those you, because of the timing and somebody's observing you and certain things, it's a little harder for you to kind of fake your behavior for a certain length of time, right? So um, there's a yes and a no depending on the type of instrument. Now, even within your personality assessments, which are typically the ones that people are concerned about, there are built-in questions that do determine if somebody is answering in a socially desirable way. Um, or I wouldn't want to call them cheating. They're, they're trying to get the job, really. So they're answering in a socially desirable way or what they think the organization wants. In those tests, there are questions built in to detect if somebody is doing that. So that does come up, as well as if you also do a follow-up with references as well as the interview, that also helps if there are one or two questions because they usually don't um, give false answers on all the questions. They do it on one or two that they think they need a little boost with. When you, you would see a kind of an indicator, a red flag raised in the certain types of tests, and that you can raise those questions in an interview to get clarification, right? To make sure it's not really a um, is, are they really cheating? Are they really a five? Or they should be more of a three? Those types of things. Now, there's some tests, I, I don't want to, I guess, promote instruments per se, because people get it stuck in their head. But there are some instruments that are better at this than others. And when you talk with your expert, um, they will be able to guide you on which ones actually have reports that part of the report will tell you that this person um, tends to skew their results in a favorable way more than um, the average person, right? So there are um, different things within the psychometrics that can be used and there are different types of psychometrics that are more susceptible to um, social desirable responding than others. But we, in most cases you do. Now the, the nice thing about it being online um, now is that you can even add the camera so you can watch them while they do it. So it's not the things I think other questions people had with that is if they let their friends or their family or somebody else do it for them. Um, so now even if it's online, you can have the camera on and you can observe them while they're doing it, that type of stuff. Um, and so you are aware of that they're alone or taking. Any other questions?
Karen. Hi, Nika. Yes, there are quite a number of questions and, I'm, and it's already 128. So we're going to see if we can just fit at least three more questions in. Um, no problems. So we have, uh, so one question coming at what stage should a psychometric assessment be done? Is it prior to the interview? I would say yes. Um, best practice would be to do it um, prior to the interview. And different types of psychometrics can be done at different stages, depending on, as I mentioned, the job level and the job type that you're looking at. Um, in typical training, they say give everyone uh, intelligence and, psych and personality inventory that can be administered to um, your entry level positions. In that case, you may sift persons based on their, their resume and so forth first to bring your numbers down and then you can um, administer the psychometric to a smaller number and then do uh, interviewed for any kind of verification you would like with certain um, persons. Um, the reason I, I say don't put a psychometric last or at the end, they do not measure um, psychosis or anything like that, right? They're measuring behavioral competencies. So they're not an indicator for those types of things. That's a different type of um, psychology assessment. And so that it doesn't help you at the end. In the middle, it gives you a little more information that you can use. And um, in part of uh, our best practice that we use, we will actually pull out questions based on what we see from the psychometric results and ask them in the interview so that you get that, um, you can get that clarification on anything that you're seeing in terms of red flags. If you do it last, you, are, you have no um, means to determine um, if the person was a little nervous or, um, or if the person just misunderstood the question or um, anything else. You won't be able to get any feedback on it if you do it after the interview. Great, thank you. Um, so, one of the participants is asking, you mentioned that leadership strategies would need to be adjusted in times of crisis. And they're just asking if you could just expand or expound a little more on that particular comment. Sure. So um, in the time of crisis and beyond, you're dealing with an entire change process. And in this case, as I gave the simple example of um, persons working from home and working remotely. How you manage someone who's working at home um, may have to be adjusted in that we are now seeing that a lot of schools are also doing online learning for their children. So if you have an employee who then has a young child at home and they are working from home, they may have a difficulty with some of the work hours, the typical work hours, but they're going to execute their task as they should because they're conscientious and they're being responsible. So in terms of the way in which you communicate, um, when you communicate, how time management, the deadlines and timelines for those individuals may change um, or maybe have to be adjusted. Um, you're also going to deal with persons with different types of behaviors. As I mentioned before, if you are working from home, it's not as easy to contact, even though technology is available, to contact, if you are working those late hours, you may not be able to reach your manager at the same time frame and so forth. So they may have to do more problem solving and taking initiative. So the way in which you lead someone who is more autonomous in the way they operate will also need to be adjusted. Now this goes, I can't say, well, okay, do this and do that in leadership. It will depend on the organization, the types of job duties that are being executed 
and um, the individual that you're managing. But it will have to, you will have to make some changes to the manner in which you communicate, motivate, and um, coach persons who are not physically in your space, that are not physically coming in in an office from eight to four. Um, and then with the introduction of uncertainty, because once you've gone through some type of crisis situation, um, we're all kind of changed in some way. So just having that um, patience and empathy and some other traits in there comes into play a little bit more because we're all not sure and the uncertainty makes people a little nervous and um, uh, it makes it a little difficult for them to handle certain types of stress. So all of those things come as part of um, what you do as a leader, uh, manager, supervisor, um, even, well, team lead, or if you are the, because leadership is not a title, right? Leadership is also just, it's a skill set. It's your, it's your competency. So the way in which that is executed will be adjusted a bit. Um, so based on your organization, you will define leadership for those particular um, for those particular roles or those certain departments in a new way, and you will identify the behaviors that you think will be most effective. They may not; ju they just may not be the same behaviors that are effective at this point in time, or what used to be effective in the past. Thank you so much, Nika. I was hoping that we could take another question, but we are all out of time because um, we've gotten some really good questions from participants. Uh, but these are things, if you contact us and the contact information has been put in the chat box, we, you can contact Lockjaw GSP Consulting. We will be able to answer all, and, all these questions for you. Um, we have years, decades of experience in terms of using uh, assessments. Um, for various situations and in various times, good times, bad times, times of crisis. Um, our team, uh, several members of our team are certified in a variety of instruments and we are behavioral specialists. So we have the experience in implementing this, whether it's for training or succession planning. So we invite you to contact us to get more information. Thank you, Nika, for your knowledge and insight today. It was very, very helpful. No problem. Whenever you need me. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to hear from you and whether or not this particular topic, competencies in times of crisis, and our speaker, uh, you found it valuable and relevant. And therefore, we invite you to complete our online survey. We will be dropping that link once again in the chat box or you can scroll up, it was dropped in earlier, but we will be dropping it in again so that you can give us feedback on this particular webinar. In this time of crisis, we feel it's part of our corporate social responsibility to remind you uh, and to share with you, uh, distance makes us stronger, so please stop to spread. If you need to venture outside, maintain physical distancing, Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds and avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. We are all in this together. So be supportive, be careful, be alert, be kind. We thank you for joining Lockjaw GSB Consulting for another webinar Wednesday. Remember all our services, all our instruments are online. We are here and ready to respond to your needs it takes nothing to call, contact us and ask the question. Um, so whether it is you're looking to bring your business online, to prepare your business for the future, give us a call. We have our email address there, email addresses, contact numbers. Uh, you can also visit our website to get that contact information. But write us, call us. It doesn't take anything. We'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you for joining us.